We are continuing in this second portion of adulteration by focusing on economic adulteration. And economic adulteration may not be something that we think about all the time. We may think of that aesthetic adulteration that we mentioned in the first component about um, re, um, excuse me, rodents, pests being in the facility and, and that type of adulteration. We introduced the concept of injurious and may render injurious uh, adulteration, but now we're really talking about something different. And, and we can see modern examples as well as historical examples when we look at the passage of the 1906 Act. And I want to start out today by giving you an example of a modern way that economic adulteration appears. And it's uh, encouraging for you as you learn about this area to look and see if you can find examples of economic adulteration in your uh, own experience with food. And so to set the stage for this video, when we're talking about economic adulteration, really what we're talking about and what you probably learned from the reading was that we're passing off an inferior product as a superior product by substituting, omitting, changing the formula, the ingredients, so that it looks like it's something that is wholesome or uh, in a way a, a superior product and in fact it doesn't contain that ingredient. And an article that I wrote a couple of years ago and it was a subject that got a lot of attention was on blueberry bits and that's what this uh, video is on and it's an example of economic adulteration that we see in our modern times. Pictures of blueberries are prominently displayed on the front of many food packages. Here they are on boxes of muffins, cereals, and breads. But turn the packages around, and suddenly the blueberries disappear. They're gone, replaced in the ingredients list with sugars, oils, and artificial colors derived from petrochemicals. This bag of blueberry bagels sold at Target stores is made with blueberry bits. And while actual blueberries are found further down the ingredients list, the blueberry bits themselves don't even contain bits of blueberries. They're made entirely from sugar, corn cereal, modified food starch, partially hydrogenated vegetable oil, artificial flavor, cellulose gum, salt, and artificial colors like blue number two, red number 40, green number three, and blue number one. What's missing from that list? Well, blueberries. Where did the blueberries go? They certainly didn't end up in total blueberry pomegranate cereal. This cereal, made by General Mills, contained neither blueberries nor pomegranates. They're nowhere to be found. But the cereal is made with red number 40, blue number 2, and other artificial colors. And it's even sweetened with sucralose, a chemical sweetener. And that's in addition to the sugar, corn syrup, and brown sugar syrup that's already on the label. A lot of products that imply they're made with blueberries contain no blueberries at all. And many that do contain a tiny amount of blueberries cut their recipes with artificial blueberry ingredients to make it look like their products contain more blueberries than they really do. And so this is an example that we see from the reading that is truly about economic, I don't use the word cheap, but economic way of making a product affordable for the, the facility to make, to make their margins on, and a way to substitute an expensive ingredient, blueberries, into a product in a very cost-effective way. And the reading is clear that it talks about this being an economic cheat and that this really was a way of uh, passing cost or avoiding cost. And for the most part, the reading is correct that this is a way of economics and this is about money. And it really isn't about harm or injury like we saw with the other definitions of adulteration. But that isn't always the case. We can think of modern examples uh, such as melamine that we'll talk about here in the statutory definition that actually does have an adverse effect, does have an injurious, uh, you know, to use the language from the previous uh, component, poisonous or deleterious effect uh, on the person consuming it. So it is about both economics and it is about adulteration in terms of injury. Now in 1906, we had four prohibited acts that were outlined in the 1906 Pure Food and Drug Act. 
And again, remembering this is a five page act, so to have a section dedicated to economic adulteration tells you a little bit about the history. And the four acts are pretty understandable. We're talking about omitting a valuable constituent, omitting blueberries, substitution. We're substituting blueberries by using this blueberry bit, which is really a combination of other ingredients. Uh, concealing damaged or inferior ingredients, we didn't see that in this example in the video. Uh, falsifying nutritional information, this is where the melamine comes in. Melamine being used as an ingredient to boost protein count primarily. And by using that inferior ingredient rather than a true protein source, we're, we've committed economic adulteration uh, as well as potentially getting into the definition of adulteration that is uh, poisonous or deleterious. So we had four prohibited acts, but we had two safe harbors in the original 1906 act. We had the distinctive names and the plainly labeled as an imitation. The distinctive names, we had the bread spread, which is here on the far right, the strawberry flavor bread spread. And what the distinctive names was saying is this product isn't passing itself off as peanut butter or as strawberry jam. That would be a whole food and we would expect certain ingredients to be in that food and if there were substitutions, omissions, concealing, so on, we could say there was economic adulteration. Here under distinctive names, we're saying we're not peanut butter, we're not jam, we're bread spread. We're something different, we are our own category. And the other way that you could get around the 1906 Act was to have something that's plainly said on the, imita said on the label, imitation. We're imitation butter, we're imitation peanut butter, we're imitation salad dressing. And that way the consumer was informed that they weren't buying the whole food product. They weren't buying salad dressing or peanut butter. They were buying an imitation product. And so if they wanted to make that determination that the imitation product was suitable to them, then they weren't being cheated. And so these were the two safe harbors that we had. And this uh, w was kind of the common backdrop for the 1906 Act, but there were some additional ways that economic adulteration was occurring. And a lot of that was captured in Upton Sinclair's The Jungle. He looked both at meat production, but he also looked at what ingredients were going in in the food production process. And in the article we have, we see some very common examples, some harmless examples, like milk diluted with water. In Upton Sinclair's The Jungle, we actually see some really scary examples and really egregious examples of what was happening. We had ink dye being used for food coloring, sawdust for fillers, uh, things like this, industrial products going into food that no, what we wouldn't normally expect. And this was as a way to fill it, to uh, add bulk, add protein, add color, and, and do these different things and, and pass it off as a particular product. So this was the backdrop for the 1906 act that was occurring. and. Uh, it had to be in there because there was such an outcry about what was occurring. And even though we had it in there, we had this 1906 Act which specified economic adulteration, we really ended up with an unworkable Act. The distinctive names and the imitation product, as the reading gets into, it didn't work. It, it provided too many loopholes in the legislation and it made the litigation unpredictable. The courts didn't really have a way of interpreting or defining what distinctive names was on a consistent basis, what it meant to be imitation. And the reading, you know, gives examples of things like macaroons that you would think, you know, wouldn't be a very difficult category for the judges to to discern and fit into a, a, this uh, framework, but it did end up being that way. So in 1938, you know, 32 years later, 32 years of litigation, we have the new Food and Drug and Cosmetic Act, and we're including all of these lessons that we've learned in these 32 years. And one of the lessons that we've learned is that these loopholes can't be there. So we have broader language for economic adulteration and no safe harbors. Distinctive names, imitations, doesn't matter if you're doing that anymore. That's not going to get you out of uh, uh, an enforcement action for economic adulteration. We also had this idea that standards of identity would be created and following the passage of 1938 um, Act and in particular really in the 1950s we see a big promulgation of the standards of identity and the idea there was that we would define what a given food product was, its name, ingredients that could be used and how it would be, how those ingredients would be used in the manufacturing. 
it provided, in essence, a floor for the standards that of quality requirements for a facility to make a particular product. So if you're going to make ketchup, there would be a standard of identity that told you what was in ketchup, what that product um, should include, you know, and, and how it was produced. So you had both the consumer having an expectation and a consistency in what that product was, and the facilities having a consistency in, in the quality standards that would go on. And if you did a non-standardized product, if you did something that wasn't from the standards of identity, it had to be labeled on the food. And economic adulteration is one of those areas where we get into a line where it's adulteration and misbranding. Misbranding meaning something wrong on the label. And we'll get into that next week. But this is sort of an area where you know it requires both disclo disclosure on the label, which would be a branding issue, as well as being produced to a certain quality standard, which would be uh, the adulteration standard. And so this, for the most part, clarified what we mean by economic adulteration and made the 1906 Act, which really was difficult to interpret and difficult to work with, uh, much more workable. So one of the things that we continue to come back to is this idea that we always need to define what we're talking about. When we look at simple phrases in the statute, we can't take those at face value. We have to ask, what does it mean? And we started the class by asking this question of, what does food mean? And we ask this in the context to understand whether or not the Food and Drug Administration or the USDA Food Safety Inspection Service had jurisdiction. And we come back to that question when we're uh, talking about economic adulteration. And we come, to, come back to it in particular because 347B states that a food shall be deemed adulterated if, and then we have the prohibited acts. But what does it mean, food? When we're talking about economic adulteration, we're not always talking about a distinctive food item. We, you know, we're, we mentioned that you could have a product that is calling itself bread spread, which would be, uh, we would, closest comparison we could say would be a peanut butter or a jam, depending on the, the product. But it, it, is, it, is, it is claiming to be its own thing. Even though we don't have the distinctive names anymore, we still see these cases. What do we compare this to? How do we say that this is including an inferior ingredient or one of these other prohibited acts? And the Burley case is one that we have that the court attempted to give us some framework about what this definition of food means. And it's a great example to look at. And it's an issue that the Supreme Court hasn't uh, touched on, and that's what this uh, citation here, cert denied, means the Supreme Court denied the request to hear the appeal. And the two ways that we could define food when we're talking about this section 347B is in the case of Burley, they had this orange drink, and that's what they call it, Burley's orange drink. And it's, in essence, it um, could be compared to orange juice. Uh, you know, that's probably the most uh, logical, I guess, way you could think about it. If you're thinking it's orange, then it must contain oranges. So we could compare it to orange oranges, which would be a recognized food category, or we could compare it to the recognized excuse me, not the recognized, but the, actually the alleged economic product. And here, we would compare it to Burley's orange beverage. And, and as its own category, what are our expectations about Burley's orange product? What would it contain? Now, the issue with Burley's orange was that it contained 6% orange juice. And the uh, rest, majority of it was water and some food coloring, a little bit of lemon juice. And the government argued that this was a case of economic adulteration, and they wanted to give this issue to the jury to say, here's Burley's orange drink. What do you think is in this product? Based on the marketing, based on the label, what do you think is in this product? And if you think that it is uh, orange juice, then we can say it's economically adulterated because you, know, you would expect orange juice to be how much? 100%, 90%, and the jury would come back and give you an answer and if we're below that threshold, then this isn't orange juice and it's economically adulterated. Burley, of course, didn't want that argument. Burley wanted to say food under the act means a recognized food category. Here, we need to be compared to orange juice, to undiluted orange juice. And we need to ask the jury not what percentage they uh, think this should have, and therefore, is it below the percentage they think it should have. But we should ask the jury, when you look at this marketing, are you confused 
that you would buy this for undiluted orange juice. And if you're confused, if you think, yes, this should be undiluted orange juice, then we have committed economic adulteration. But if you're not confused, if you know that this is an orange drink and you have no expectation that this would be 100% undiluted orange juice, then we haven't committed economic adulteration. The judge held two things, and one of them is a little bit frustrating, and the other pretty much makes sense for what the, the case was saying. And the first thing that the judge held was that in each individual case, we're going to have to make this evaluation over and over again, whether or not to use the standard uh, category, such as orange juice, or whether or not we're going to have to use the uh, alleged economic product as its own standard. So it's going to be a case-by-case -case basis. The second thing the judge said is that we have to, in this case, apply the concrete standard. And the concrete standard here was what uh, Burley was advocating for, which was let's ask the jury if they're confusing this product for orange juice and not this more subjective question about what percentage orange juice do you think Burley contains. And, and so this went to the lower court. It had gone up from, excuse me, a district court up to a circuit court. And then the circuit court sent it back to the, the district court to say, here's the standard, give this to the jury, and come back with the result. And so this is some lessons that we can learn from uh, the case, and we can see why these cases uh, are harder to bring for the FDA. The litigation is more involved and it's a little more difficult. But in cases typically where we see that it's not as much about an economic harm, but about an actual physical harm, such as the melamine, the FDA will not pursue this framework. This framework is more difficult to work through. They'll go through the, what we talked about in the first component about the two standards for adulteration or some other standard if it's not within that category as we talked about. But the FDA is coming back around to this idea in the Food Safety Modernization Act, and it may be something that we see given new life and, and new wings to take on because there are more and more examples of products coming in that are using filler products to either bolst uh, bolster the nutritional panel, give it some facts that aren't necessarily there or are there because of inferior ingredients, or actually um, omitting or substituting ingredients. And we, s and we see comments in the new rules that the uh, FDA issued for the Food Safety Modernization Act where the agency really wants to try and bring this idea back. So this gives you a sense of what economic adulteration is. I encourage you to look around for some examples that you may be encountering and also to keep in mind that as, uh, as difficult as this framework is, we may see it coming back 